Good morning, church. Are y'all ready to praise and worship? Yeah. Let's go ahead and stand and rise if you're able to, and let's worship together. Who are we? Then you will be mine.
I've got to, I've got to get my notes here. But we have some more things to celebrate today. We started the uh, the Drive to 65 campaign. Y'all are familiar with that if you aren't. And uh, someone will share that with you after the service today. But I told you I would keep you posted on how we're doing, and that's what I'm going to do today. Uh, just to remind you, now, I'm going to do something here. My wife calls these my Mr. Magoo glasses. Y'all forget them. <laughs> uh, okay. Right now, what I'd like to do, we're going to go back uh, and discuss what we did. This this is for the month of August, each weekend. The first week, can I get a drum roll back there, Chris, please? We did a whopping $2,770. Now the goal was 5,000, so, which brings us to this past weekend, which is the last weekend we have of record. This does not count today, so we have a couple of more weekends to go. Now we get a really big drum roll. <laughs> last week, we had a whopping $2,225. For a total, two week total of $4,795. So if someone could pitch in today, make it an even five, we'll be very appreciative, okay? <laughs> but well done, we want to thank everyone uh, that's contributed to this, and those of you that have been in prayer for thought about this, this is a very big thing for our church, and uh, we, can, we can see the blessings of that right now. So thank you again, thank you so very, very much. Uh, we're going to get this service started. I would like to say a prayer, so why don't we just all kind of prayerfully bow, and, and uh, we'll give the microphone to John. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this church, your house, and for the opportunity to be here, and for what it means to so many of us here, Lord, and we're just so grateful for all that you've provided, and how you've taken care of us, Lord, through thick and thin, and you've always been there for us. We're thankful for our family being together and feeling whole with the presence of Frank and Lord for what he means to us and for so many that give so much of their time and effort and talents to make this service for you. We lift this service to you today, Lord. We lift it high. We pray that you would hear our praise and bless us with your presence. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Wayne. All right, now it's time for small talk. Where's all the little ones? Come on down. I know I see a bunch of them out there. Come on, come on, come on. You know, Asher's not here. Where's Asher today? Come on, come on down. Oh, now just have a seat right here. All right. Come on. Okay, so is everybody back in school? Yes. What are we going to do when we go back to school? Make sure you're following Learn. That's a very good answer. Because we're going to learn about all kinds of things, right? Because the different grades that you go to, the different grades that you participate in, you learn different things. So you have to be prepared. You have to have a notebook. You have to have uh, pencils and pens and, uh, and colors and, and these pumps. Huh? Erasers? I need a lot of erasers. I mess up. I, I, I should buy stock in eraser company because when I was a kid, I erased all the time. And then when I didn't erase all the time, I cheated. Y'all ever cheat erasers? No. no. You don't want to do that? No, don't do that. No, no. Don't do that. Anyway, but going back to school is your opportunity to learn different things, right? But it's also your opportunity to share different things. To share by the way you talk to people, to share how you act towards people, to share what Jesus has taught you that's living in your heart. Pretty good, right? So we bring all this stuff home that we learn, and what we learn on Sundays, we take back with us Monday to share with all our friends, because you know what? That's what God wants you to do. He wants you to share how much you love Him by the way you act and by the way you talk. That's pretty cool stuff, huh? 
So let's give thanks. Let's pray. So dear God, dear God, thank you, thank you, thank you for letting me, for letting me learn, 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 and thank you, and, and thank you for letting me, for letting me share, share how much, how much I love you. I love you. In Jesus' name. Jesus Amen. 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 All right, are ready to sing? Let's sing. Put your hands down. Okay. Jesus loves me, this I know. For Scripture says, For therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things pass away. Behold, new things have come. Let us pray. Most gracious Father, we ask that you open our minds as our scripture is read this morning. Open our hearts that the Holy Spirit is here among us. And open our eyes to see and feel the presence and the love of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about what makes a superhero, right? We've talked several different times, what makes a superhero, who our heroes are, and we choose those heroes who are lifted up because sometimes they're the revolutions that they begin or the new things that those superheroes can bring to the table. For instance, you know, if we talk about history, we look at George Washington. Everybody knows George Washington, right? George Washington was the founder of our country, for some of you newer uh, Gen Zers and stuff, you know, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs did what? He brought us the iPhone, correct? And for the older folks in here like myself, Walt Disney, Walt Disney brought what to, to the table? He brought us a talking mouse. And those are the folks, you know, kind of like what we have in history that we share. But what did these heroes actually bring to the table? Did they actually bring something new? After all, you know, if you stop to think about it, there were there was 13 colonies way before there were 13 states, right? 13 colonies way before 13 states, and, and the cell phone had been around a lot longer than Steve Jobs when he brought in the iPhone. We used to get those little flick phones, you know, Samsung. Oh, yeah, let's go all the way back there. I wasn't going to try to age myself, but Karen's sitting up here, she's going... The big bag phone. Remember that big bag phone that you put on your seat or in between the seats, you know, plug in your cigarette lighter? Yeah, they were here a lot sooner or a lot longer than, than uh, the iPhone was. So then again, I ask, what then is new when it's exactly supposed to be new? If we look at one of the very first superheroes, the very first one that we talked about, we find it in Captain America. You know, Captain America was old and new at the same time. You see, before Captain America became Captain America, he was just plain old Steve Rogers. He was a skinny kid from 1940s New York who was transformed into this super soldier <coughs> by the government. So many years later, coming up into the 2000s, we see uh, Iron Man and Thor and a few others, they found Captain America frozen in this block of ice. And he was preserved in that block of ice by this super serum that was in his body. And since then, Captain America has been with us and he's been fighting crime and righting wrongs all over the world. But at the same time, if you stop to think about it, Captain America being old and new at the same time, we see him struggling of being suddenly reincarnated in a totally new and different reality. 
we see Captain America struggling with the way the world is now to his old-fashioned values that were formed doing, or during the Depression era and World War II. These had laid the foundation, those laid the foundation for his careful code of ethics and his strong sense of leadership. So let me turn it and put it this way. What do we do on New Year's Day? What do we make on New Year's Day? A resolution, right? What are the first words when we wake up besides, oh, I've got such a headache? <laughs> That was a joke. <laughs> One of the first things that we say, we say, today's the new year, so out with the old and in with the new. Right? We all said it. We say this when we're faced with difficulty. We say this when we're trying to lift someone's spirits. And for me, well, this motto, out with the old and in with the new, is just a little bit misleading because, because with radical change, with radical change, the old aren't being valued. The old isn't being valued. And the new, well, the new has no history whatsoever. No history whatsoever. And our scripture, our scripture speaks about being made new in Christ. In fact, the last song we heard was being made new in Christ. New vine, or new wine in new wineskins. But what does that really truly mean to be made new in Christ. Think about this. Think of your own personal testimony. When was the first time that you felt yourself being made new in Christ? When was something that's changed that made you a totally different person inside? The outside, you know, we can even change the outside because once we slough off what's being made new, the old, the old goes away, but the old still stays. So think about what made was made new in your life. What relationship between the old and the new did God establish? I want to look at Acts 2, verse 1 through 13. If you're familiar with the, the book of Acts, this is where it describes a relationship that's made perfectly. This is a whole scripture about uh, Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise, like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of fire distrib distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Hearing him speak in his own language. Right here we have all the disciples in one place. God came and poured out his Holy Spirit onto each and every one of them. God did this in a new and very radical way. God was working on each of them, working on humanity, and working to commune with humanity. They then went outside. They spoke to the crowd. And the people, the people heard them speak in their own language. Not a new script. Not a new script that they were unfamiliar with. But a language that they all knew. You see, God had spoke to them in words that they already had. He spoke to them in words that were old and new exact same place. So you see, it's not out with the old and in with the new, or the old is bad and the new is better, but God formed a covenant with them right then and there. The covenant was formed through Jesus Christ, where the old and the new merged and came together. Now, you do have to be careful when introducing something new, amen? Amen. Sometimes when talking about new experiences or new ways of living, it can be perceived as threatening to those who love the previous or old ways. And, at, and we see this exact same thing if we look at the Gospels when we talk about Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. 
I'm going to start with, the, uh, with Mark because, you see, Mark was the very first gospel written. It was written before Matthew, and it was written before Luke, and before John. Mark introduces Jesus. He opened it up, and he introduces Jesus right there out of thin air. He just takes Jesus and plops him down. Boom! He's there. Jesus appears. There's no backstory as to who the Messiah is or where he came from. It was almost as if Mark didn't really care where you've been all your life or what your past was just as long as you got to meet the Messiah in chapter 1, verse 1. Boom! Right there. Now, Matthew, on the other hand, Matthew's just a whole lot different. He's not just a little bit different, but he's a whole lot different because Matthew's approach, being a Jew himself, wants you to know who Jesus is, wants you to know exactly what Jesus is and where he came from. And therefore, he is rooted. He took Jesus and rooted Jesus in real time and in a very real place. How does he begin his gospel? He begins his gospel with genealogy, right? Right? He begins the gospel of genealogy of Christ and he goes as far back and connects Jesus not only to David but all the way back to Abraham. See, Matthew wants you to know and he makes sure that Israel is reminded of their history. He breaks Jesus' genealogy down into three very important parts. The first one shows him as being very triumphant when they were released from bondage in Egypt, right? When, when Moses took them out of Egypt and took them to the promised land and their time under King David. The second section ends with defeat. If you remember, Matthew is reminding Israel once again of being exiled to a land of Babylon. And finally, the third section ends with salvation. It ends with the resurrection. And it ends with who Jesus was as the Messiah. Now, when we get to the Gospel of Luke, we see a completely different approach. Luke was a physician. And if you know anything about physicians, they're very orderly, right? Luke writes down what he calls an orderly account and wants us to remember the Gospel in a certain way so that we can share the gospel with others. For example, at, at Christmas time, what do you think of when we, when we get ready to celebrate Christmas? When we come to church, we start decorating, we, we do the whole Advent thing, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Is it the story about Joseph that when he has a dream and the dream is to, that he needs to gather his family up and escape to Egypt? Is it that story? Or do you remember the angels, the shepherds, and Mary? When you talk about God, you might quote something from the Sermon on the Mount, or perhaps you may talk about the prodigal son. Or perhaps you like the story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and that is what we find in Luke. You see, Luke is, is, is the kind, and he's kind of like, how many of y'all remember the schoolhouse of rock? Y'all remember that? The conjunction junction. He is, Luke is the schoolhouse of rock, the gospel. He's a conjunction junction of the gospel and makes everybody come to that point. He sets everything up in that order. He wants us to remember the gospel in an orderly account so that we can share it. You know, Luke himself was a Gentile. He was also a doctor. And he wrote the gospel of Luke for, the, uh, for a man named Theopolis. And he wrote it so a Gentile would understand and wouldn't get all weighted down with the, the genealogy. And then you come to John. The Gospel of John. John was different from all three, or John is different from all three. You see Mark, Jesus appears out of nowhere. There he is. Matthew, he's connected all the way to Abraham. Luke connects Jesus all the way to Adam and Eve. But John, John flips the coin, and he does it completely different. The Gospel of John start, uh, starts like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. John wants you to know that Christ is timeless. Christ is timeless. John wants you to know that being made new in Christ is not something that you can merely put on the calendar. It's not just Christmas. It's not Easter. He wants you to know that being made new in Christ is your daily connection with God. It's your daily connection with God through the covenant that Jesus established in his body and his blood. You see, in John, the old and the new come together to form a covenant, a covenant with God 
through Jesus Christ. It is us coming together for daily communion in a brand new covenant through Christ. The Bible, the Bible offers uh, lots and lots of different stories on water. And it paints an interesting picture of what it means to be made new through Christ. Throughout Scripture, when God created the heavens and the earth, water had always been a symbol of chaos, right? God hovered over the stormy waters. Chaos existed everywhere. That's because there's something very dangerous, something very unpredictable about water. When God gave humanity dominion over the fish of the sea, God didn't give humanity dominion over the water. He kept that for himself. Because you see, water is something that needs to be parted. Water is something that needs to be walked on. Water is something to go through to get to the promised land. But with Jesus, water takes on a brand new and holy meaning. You see, Jesus was baptized in water. Jesus offers living water to us. And Jesus gave the living water to the woman at the well. Jesus transformed water into wine. Something that is so ordinary, so unpredictable, that he turned it into the best of things. Everybody's familiar with the story, right? You know, they got songs about Jesus turning water into wine. ZZ Top's got a great one out there about Jesus turning water into wine. Chapter 2, verse 1 of John, we see Jesus attending a wedding in Canaan. There we see that he has six clay jars of water for purification. But I want you to listen to something very carefully because I want to make a connection that you may or may not have ever heard. There's a problem with the number six. There's a problem with the number six. It's almost like John is making an inside joke because, you see, you cannot be cleaned with six jars. If there were seven jars, totally different story. Totally different story. Because, you see, seven is the number of perfection. Seven is the number of Sabbath. Seven is the number of God. Six. Six comes real close to seven, right? Six comes close to seven. But six is the number of our humanness. Six is the number of of our fall from grace. When Jesus was asked to transform those six jars of water into wine, he didn't dismiss it and say, no, I can't do that because six is imperfect. There needs to be seven. Go fill another one with seven because seven is perfect. When he's asked to transform those jars of water into wine, he accepts them for what they are. He transformed them into wine. So again, it's not out with the old and in with the new. He takes what is there. He takes what is there. And he transforms it and makes it into something new. So if he took something that's imperfect, and he took it and changed it into something new, the blood that Luke emphasizes and the new covenant with God is in those jars. The blood that Luke emphasizes is in that chalice to make it a new covenant. You see, Jesus wasn't an innovator so much as he was with one who remembers God's story very well. His life, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection sparked a revolution all over the world. Our newness in Christ does not mean that we do not have a history not mean we do not have a history. It doesn't mean that we have to be original. What it does mean is we are daily connected with God through the covenant Christ established in those six jars of water that he turned into the finest of fine at the wedding in Canada. That's because Christ is timeless. Christ was there in the beginning Christ will be there in the end, and Christ is here 
now. You see, Christ is the Alpha, and Christ is the Omega. Yes, there is old, and yes, there is new. And then, there's the timeless covenant of God. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we take these words that you've loved us so much that you sent Christ to die for us on a cross. That he changed something imperfect. He changed us into something new. Keeping with us who we are but becoming new through the covenant that is timeless and that is here today with us. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Gracious Father, we ask that you accept our gifts as forever and all, so that we may continue the work that you established here. In Jesus' name. And I found that little saying, um, and it made sense. It just clicked that the number six is the imperfect number. And there were six jars at the wedding. And Jesus changed those six jars into something that was perfect. He changed them into the wine that was served at the beginning because it was the best. And make that connection with us. That we are an imperfect vessel. Yet he takes it and changes it to make us new through him. We stay the same when we're new. It's timeless and it goes on forever. And it talks about how he took that bread and raised it to the heavens and he gave thanks and he broke the bread. He said, this is my body which is given for you. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. But then we come to the cup. The cup that's full of wine that he raised to the heavens and blessed. He said, this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant. Pour it out for you, for me, for forgiveness of sin. Take, drink, and do this as often in remembrance of It's an amazing story how we can come to a table and bring our full brokenness. Ask God to forgive us of our sins and approach Him and share communion with Him through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Friends, if you're new today, if you're visiting, I want you to know that this is an open table. It's set by the hand of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ Those helping with communion, please come forward. Friends, the table is set. The only thing missing is you. Join me.
body of Christ. This giant desert land, 